You know, uh, recently Bill Gates uh, talked about um, why we need to invest in, in education in fields which lead to the creation of the most jobs. And then Steve Jobs talked about uh, the, when he announced the iPad 2, he said that, um, in, in more or less these words, that we owe it, uh, it to the liberal artists, to the humanities, to all these majors who go beyond uh, engineering and science. The belief in America is that to compete globally, we have to uh, graduate more engineers and scientists. You know, I, I used to be a tech executive. I joined Duke University about six years ago. And when I joined Duke, my students started coming to me and, and asking me, Professor, what courses can we take that will make our jobs outsourcing proof? So by mistake, I stepped into the middle of some of the nastiest debates out there about globalization. I started challenging authority. I started challenging everyone and anyone who's out there on the different myths in the globalization debate. And those are the same myths in the innovation debate that getting back to what I just said about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, well, Bill Gates is the champion of engineering and science and mathematics. If you go by the conventional wisdom right now, even President Obama talked about how India and China are going to uh, outdo us based on their education. That's what I started researching. So I'm going to give you a tour of my research and change the topic completely from what you've been hearing so far. I'm going to take you abroad and tell you what's happening globally and what I've learned over the last six years being an academic. All right? All right, first of all, um, you know, just you can read through some of these, uh, these myths that we read about. We keep talking about how India and China are graduating all these zillions of engineers and how, how they're going to lead the world, be competitive, be innovative, and uh, eat our lunch because of the engineers and scientists they're graduating. We keep talking about how um, our American children are, are ranking below others abroad, and therefore they're at a disadvantage. Again, it comes back to the same theme over and over again. That it's all about math and science, which are the keys to innovation. And then we talk, keep talking about why companies are going abroad. Uh, outsourcing is happening. Glo globalization is happening. We have uh, a lot of Silicon Valley companies who have operations abroad. So jobs are going abroad. And the reason why they're going abroad, if you believe Bill Gates, is because we don't graduate enough engineers and scientists, therefore he has to go abroad. Right? We started researching that. I, I joined academia in 2004, and the first project I did after my students came to me was, let's go and find out what the reality is, because I had outsourced to India and China. I had outsourced to India and I had been to China, to be more accurate, and I knew what was and what wasn't happening there, and it wasn't consistent with, with the myths I just talked about. So we started to research it. And here's what we found. Um, first of all, in 2004, um, in, in the US actually graduated more engineers than India did. China graduated a lot of engineers, but, uh, but the numbers are suspect. The Chinese government basically puts out whatever they want you to believe, and it becomes the official <laughs> word. In other words, propaganda. Right? But um, the numbers basically told a different story than, than what you typically heard in the United States press. And this is when I had joined academia. And I, was, uh, I, I founded two technology companies, and then I became a, an academic. And uh, I love being called a professor. I mean, that was a big deal for me. When my students started coming up to me and saying, professor, what should we do, blah, blah, blah. So I did the research. And first paper I published created a firestorm. All we did in that paper was publish these data. And my dean at the uh, Pratt School of Engineering at Duke University ended up in being invited to the White House for the State of the Union address with President Bush. She sat next to four of the president's advisors who were asking her about Professor Wadwa's research. And I started thinking, oh my god, if these people are taking me so seriously, something is really wrong with this country. <laughs> <laughs> and all I did was have a bunch of students at Duke University publish a paper which showed that these were the actual numbers of graduates from India and China. So then we started doing more research. I started getting, taking myself very seriously <laughs> and doing more research. We tried to find out why companies were going abroad. And, and you know, they were, I mean, in academia, whenever you publish a report which defies conventional wisdom, you get attacked by the forces that be. But, you know, they have antibodies in academia. And when a non-academic like me gets in there and gets all this attention, there's a lot of jealousy, and they start attacking you left, right, and center. So fine, there were a lot of questions. OK, well, well what is the long-term trend? What are the counterfactuals? All these words I had never heard of. They started attacking me. I mean, we did more research to find out why companies were going abroad. 
And the, you know, if you go back to slide I showed you, it showed China way, way up there, graduating a lot of engineers, the U.S. graduating more than India. So what the, data, what the research should have shown us was that what people said was that there were, grad, there were an adequate supply of engineers in China and not in India, and the U.S. was okay. Yet they showed us the exact opposite. I was confused of what was going on here. And then we asked them what the skills of Indians and Chinese are versus Americans. Despite what Bill Gates says, it wasn't that uh, uh, they were you know, uh, brilliant people abroad and they weren't skilled in the United States. What, what companies told us was they were going to India and China because it was cheaper. Indians, uh, Americans were more productive or as productive as Indians were. They were, the quality of work produced in America was equal to better than India and China. But as I'll show you in the next slide, um, one slide after, it was cheaper. And then we asked about all these degrees that were graduating. Companies basically told us that they didn't care about the degrees, that degrees didn't matter. So I started thinking to myself when I saw all these data coming back to us, saying, what in the world is going on? Why is America obsessed with engineering degrees when American companies that are going abroad say their engineering degrees don't matter? Okay. Why are companies going abroad? Because it's cheaper. Nothing wrong with American workers. Now, why don't we admit that? Because when Bill Gates, if Bill Gates was to say he's going to India because it's cheaper there, he would get trashed by the media, right? But the reality is the reason why companies go abroad is because it's cheaper, and it's in their, it's in their interest to go abroad because it's cheaper, because the markets are growing abroad. That's where the future is. India and China are growing at phenomenal rates right now. The U.S. is stagnant. The revenue that American companies are producing abroad is far greater than what they're producing in America. That's why they're going overseas. But we're not getting a straight discourse in America. We're getting all these stories about why they're going abroad. So this is what my research re revealed. So again, I, I defied conventional wisdoms, challenged authority, and then I did more research. Again, you know, whenever you do academic research, you get intelligent questions after the dust settles. So then the question was, what's been the long-term trend? And we looked at the long-term trend. Well, China, even though the numbers are bogus, they're bogus going in the right direction. <laughs> so what we found was that uh, if we looked at the data in bachelor's degrees in engineering and science, the United States was greater than India, but India was inching up, which means India isn't doing well. It should be imploding as a tech center. China should be doing really well based on its ba and bachelor's degrees. Look at master's degrees. China graduates more masters in, in engineering than does the USA. PhDs, if you want to worry about China taking over the world, these data show that China graduates more engineers than does the USA. So go by the conventional wisdoms, conventional beliefs in America that innovation equals engineering and science graduation rates. And therefore, whichever country, as, as our president uh, said recently, whichever country graduates the most wins. Well, what should be happening is that China should be the world leader in innovation. True? I mean, these numbers are pretty, pretty clear. The U.S. stagnant, India is in pathetic shape. I mean, India graduates less than 1,000 PhDs per year. So if you look at this data, that's less than the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, professors that universities in India need to hire, given their growing economy. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm walking through you through different semesters of work I did when I joined Duke University. So my conclusion was that India is dead on arrival. The Indian IT industry is going to implode. And I said this in several media interviews, and I became extremely popular in my home country. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so much so that in one stage, I did an interview with a journalist in India, and she hung up on me. <laughs> and she said, uh, sent me an email basically saying that I don't want to talk to traders, <laughs> that you people go abroad, and suddenly you become Americans, and you become disloyal to your country. Why? Because I said that India's graduation rates are awful, and based on the data, India will, uh, India will implode as a tech center. Now, little did I know I was wrong. I'm going to show you why. We actually went to India a year later, and we started going inside the Indian industry. And I was stunned at what we saw. In every area we went to, in every, we looked into different industries. In every industry we went to, we were absolutely astonished at what was happening there. You know, take pharmaceuticals. The most sophisticated drug discovery is being done in India right now. Um, I happen to be a heart patient. And heart patients take four medications uh, every day. Uh, Dr. Reddy's of India is developing uh, what's called the poly pill, for example. You know, um, my medication here probably costs $10,000, $20,000 a year and gets subsidized. It costs me 1000 bucks 
by the time I'm done with uh, you know, paying all the fees, the poly bill will cost $30 per patient per year. Okay. That's a, it's one pill which combines all four medications. That's innovation. But you're seeing the same type of innovation across the pharmaceutical industry. The most sophisticated pharma research is being done in India, which is good for us. Because if, if they can come up with $30 pills, it'll help us in a big way. Okay. And then we looked at aerospace. The most sophisticated uh, uh, systems are being developed in India, flight inverting controls, and so on and so on. I don't want to get technical over here, but we were blown away with what we saw in the, in the uh, aerospace industry. We looked at the consumer appliances. Guess where your washers and dryers are being designed? In Pune, India. <laughs> okay. The Amazon Kindle, guess where it was designed? In New Delhi. Do you read about it? Do you think Amazon is going to advertise designed in New Delhi? <laughs> no way. And that's why you don't hear about it. What's happened is that American companies have outsourced to such a large extent that, that there are hundreds of thousands of people doing sophisticated R&D in India right now, despite all the data I showed you, despite uh, what I showed you over there. You go to China. China, um, uh, basically, you, you land and you're blown away with how advanced this country is. It's like a modern version of Europe. I mean, it's just amazing to see how a country has gone from poverty to being an advanced economy in such a short period of time. But in a nutshell, China is a giant copying machine. They're pirating American technology on a scale unprecedented in history. That uh, they're uh, excelling in imitation. They're not innovating at all. I, I mean, I was stunned. I mean, first three or four trips there, I was blown away. I was raving about China. But we started peeling the onion and going inside the labs, even uh, of IBM and Microsoft, I was stunned at how little was happening there. The, uh, the difference between India and China was that American companies were showing off about the work they're doing in China because they had to keep the Chinese happy. The Chinese government is putting intense pressure on them to, to show that they were moving outsource, they were moving R&D over there, but they don't trust the Chinese. Therefore, they pretend to be doing it there. In India, they have to hide what they're doing. So this is a, was a mystery to me. How, you know, fine, this is what American companies want to do, but how can India succeed? How can you take a country with such a poor education system and turn it into an R&D hub? And I spent a lot of time um, researching this. I mean, we looked at the data. I mean, the numbers I showed you of graduation rates in India, you have to discount them by half because half of the output of Indian colleges is complete garbage. Right. Yet, if you add up the numbers, um, uh, they don't make sense at all. Just read these data. Right. We try to figure out how India is doing it, and what we realized was that the Indians have done what the Japanese did with manufacturing, that they learned the best practices of the West and perfected them. Not in manufacturing, but in, in re-educating people. That they can take the output of a weak education system and re-educate people. And here's how they do it. First of all, in recruitment. When you folks want to get a job, you put together a great resume. You get your, your parents, your, your friends, you know, to help you put together a great resume. What does a great resume tell you? It tells you how good your friends are at helping you put together a great resume. <laughs> right? It doesn't tell you how confident you are. Well, Indian companies figure that out. Indians are very good at putting together great resumes. Right? So they don't recruit you based on resumes anymore. They recruit you based on your knowledge, based on your skills. They put you through tests, and they have internal ways of interviewing you. And then uh, when, you join, uh, when you used to join IBM in the 1970s, you'd get 18 months of training, 17 months of training. Now you get a day and a half. American companies don't invest in workforce training anymore. You join Infosys, India's leading IT company, you get four months of training the day you join. And if you happen to be an art and science major, you get another three months, seven months before you start work. And that's when the training starts. The ongoing skill development you get in Indian companies is just off the charts. This is what, like what America used to be. Managerial development. My students at Duke, when they graduate, it takes them eight, eight to eight and a half years to become managers. Indians can do it in three and a half years or three years. So they perfected the practices of workforce development. Performance appraisal. Why do you get appraised over here? So the company can cover its butt in case they have to fire you. Well, in India, it's, in India, it's used to develop your skills. The result of it is that uh, despite the fact that these industries have been growing at 40% a year, attrition rates have been dropping in India. So the magic over here is innovation happens by investing in people. The lesson I've learned through all my research is it's all about people. You invest in your people and you can uplift them. The lesson for America is that if we're going to survive globalization, 
Globalization is going to demolish industries. We can't stop it. The world has changed. The cat is out of the bag. The US is no longer the only advanced economy in the world. There are going to be many other advanced economies. You just have to go to India and China to see what's happening there. You have extreme poverty, but you also have extreme riches in R&D and innovation. Even in China, the next generation, despite what I said about China, the kids out of school right now are innovating in, in the, just like Americans are innovating. We can't stop them. So the lesson I've learned is that unless America goes, goes back to its roots and starts training its workforce, investing in upgrading them, investing in, in, in their skills, we're going to be dead meat. Basically, we're going to become a third world country unless we invest in our people. So when you hear my talks and you hear, read my articles, it's always all about people, people, people. Innovation policy, how do you take a region and make it productive by focusing on people? Okay. Let me show you some more data uh, before I wrap up. Um, Silicon Valley, where we are right now, guess what? 52% of our startups are founded by people like me. 52% foreign-born. 25% nationwide are found, founded by people like me. A quarter of all the global patents in America are, are from people like me. Okay. Now, the sad thing for America is that we've been so stupid with our immigration policy that we've been bringing in people on temporary visas but not turning them into per permanent residents. So we have a major problem brewing right now. We, have a, you know, we keep hearing about the, the 12 million unskilled immigrants, the illegals uh, who we're trying to do a battling about amnesty for. There are million skilled immigrants who came to America legally, doctors, lawyers, scientists, researchers, innovators, who could be helping our country grow and, and launching the next 52% of our companies. But because there are no visas for them, they're going back home. The United States is experiencing the first reverse brain drain ever. We don't even know what a reverse brain drain is. We don't even know what a brain drain is. This is what India and China experienced. This is what Ireland experienced. This is what Poland experienced. This is what Germany experienced in different times in history. America has always been a land of immigrants. We've always been a recipient of knowledge of, of people who can come in and challenge the, the waves of people who came before them and make them innovate. How do you innovate? You innovate when you're challenged, when you have to think smarter, you have to work harder. This is why America is what it is, because you've had waves of immigrants coming here challenging the people before them. So you, we've always been you know, bitching about immigrants, taking jobs away. That's always been, the, you know, in America, go through the American newspapers, we've always been complaining about uh, you know, generations of immigrants taking jobs away. Because what happened was that you'd have the Jews coming here, you'd have the Hungarians coming here, the Poles coming here, the Irish coming here, the Chinese coming here, the Indians coming here, making people work harder and think smarter. And when you have to work harder and think smarter, you have to innovate as well. You have to change your ways, you can't keep being you know, locked in the past, you have to think smarter and, um, and think outside the box. That's been the American advantage. The sad thing is, for the first time ever, because of our screwed up immigration policies, we're now, the tide has turned now, people are going back. And this is why India is rising the way it is, and this is why China is rising. Even China, the new Chinese are beginning to innovate right now. So we're basically our own worst enemies right now in, in, in letting the tide turn and letting innovation go abroad. We need these people coming here and making us think harder and making us innovative. So this is the work I've been researching. I've been writing a lot about it. If you go to my website, www.wadhwa.com, you'll read zillions of articles where I've talked about these things. Thank you. Yeah.